Okay, so I think we'll begin. Thank you so much everyone for joining us today. My name is Amy Sam. I am the Health Education Project Specialist at the Maxwell and Elmer Blum Patient Family Learning Center at Mass General Hospital. Today's program is a special collaboration between the Blum Center and Mass General Corrigan Minahan Heart Center. Before we get started, just wanna go over a few items with you all. Please note that today's program is being recorded for educational purposes. If you're interested in viewing the recording, you may visit the Mass General Blum Center website at massgeneral.org forward slash hyphen Blum, I'm sorry, slash Blum hyphen center. Please note that everyone is in listen only mode. Everyone has been muted so that we can hear our guest speaker today. If you have any questions for our guest speaker, please use the chat feature which, which is located at the bottom of your screen. We'll have time for them in the end. Only Blum Center staff and the guest speaker will see your questions. Please do not share any personal medical information or questions in the chat box. If you have a personal medical question, please ask your doctor. slides. So next, I would like to introduce you all to Dr. Doreen DeFerrier. Dr. DeFerrier is the Associate Director of the MGH Adult Congenital Heart Disease Program. She is also the Co-Director of the MGH Cardiovascular Disease and Pregnancy Program and Program Director of the Cardiovascular Disease Fellowship. She is board certified in internal medicine, adult cardiovascular disease, and adult echocardiography. She joins us today to give a presentation on the anatomy and long-term management of a complex congenital heart condition called Tetralogy of Fallot. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Teferia Ye. Great, thank you so much, Amy. It truly is such a pleasure to be speaking with you all today. As Amy mentioned, my name is Doreen Teferia Ye. I'm a cardiologist at Mass General Hospital. I focus on um, seeing patients who were born with heart conditions in our congenital heart disease program. And I also focus on seeing women who are pregnant or postpartum with cardiac disease in our cardiovascular disease and pregnancy program. It really is such a pleasure uh, to talk today. I'm going to be talking a little bit about a, a common congenital heart condition called Tetralogy of Fallot. You may know someone with this condition, you may have it yourself, um, but hopefully we can learn a little bit today about why it's just so important for long-term cardiovascular follow-up for patients born with Tetralogy of Fallot. Before I begin, I wanna extend an extremely um, heartfelt thank you to a terrific and wonderful foundation, charity organization called Heartfelt Dreams Foundation. This foundation was created by um, a, a patient and special friend of mine and her husband, Lori and Eric Ankerud, and they have done just a tremendous, tremendous job and service to our congenital heart disease patients in the recent years um, in starting this foundation, and that they have helped to support bringing heart, the congenital heart patients to ACHD centers such as the Mass General ACHD Center so that they can receive specialized congenital heart care from people who are expert in the field. And their foundation supports help not only in transportation to appointments, but accommodations, emotional support, support for our cardiac nursing staff and support for our pregnant patients with cardiac disease as well. So we're extraordinarily thankful for all of the hard work um, from Eric and Lori and the tremendous support of Heartfelt Dreams for our congenital heart disease population. So what will we talk about today? Well, we'll take a little bit of a step back and we'll just review what does it look like to be a congenital heart disease patient in the United States in 2021? Congenital heart disease really is defined as any abnormality of the heart that someone is born with. And this could be as simple as a small hole in the heart to as complicated as very severe abnormalities of the heart muscle and valves. So we'll take a step back and talk briefly about ACHD, adult congenital heart disease in the United States. We'll focus a bit on Tetralogy of Fallot, which as I mentioned is a common congenital heart condition. We have many, many hundreds of patients we care for on a daily basis in our program with Tetralogy of Fallot. We'll talk about why it's important for these patients who have surgeries that are corrective as children to continue to follow with a cardiologist as an adult. And what are the things we look out for as adult cardiologists? 
we'll talk a little bit about implications in pregnancy and then review some of the surgeries and procedures that could be needed for the adult patient with tetralogy of Fallot. So again, just take a step back. I include this slide in many talks that I give about any form of congenital heart disease. Again, a condition that one is born with some abnormality of the heart muscle. This is a graphic published in the 1960s, looking at children born with various types of congenital heart problems. On this axis over here, this is the percentage of death, and this is the mean age in years. So what you'll see is that normal patients with born without any cardiac congenital problems in the mid 1960s, more than half of them should have survived to be 70 years old or older. You'll see with any form of congenital heart defect, before it is repaired, if it goes uncorrected, the life expectancy of an individual with congenital heart disease is reduced. And you'll see before the era where we could surgically correct and treat Tetralogy of Fallot, 50% of kids born with Tetralogy of Fallot died by the time they were 10 years old. Sorry, Thankfully, sorry to, to interrupt, I'm oh, so sorry. Um, uh -huh. I don't see your slides on the screen. Oh, oh okay. Um, sorry about that. Um, I see them here. Are you not able to see, see any of the slides? No. Hmm. Okay, let me go back and... Um, let me reshare the. Um, let me reshare the slides. Sorry about that. I didn't realize. Um, let me just go back. Share again to share the screen. Okay, are you able to see a slide now? Looks good, thank you. Okay, great, sorry about that. I, I, I guess I was looking at the slides and you weren't able to see them, so sorry about that. I will move forward and here is my initial slide just about heartfelt dreams. Um, you can certainly find this foundation online if you're interested in um, helping support their mission to support our congenital heart patients. I did review the objectives of what we'll talk about today and I was on this graphic, so we hadn't gone too far. But you'll see on this slide, on this axis here is percentage death. So these were kids who had born with a congenital heart condition who never received surgery in the early 1960s before we were routinely doing surgeries for patients born with congenital heart conditions. And here is the age in years. And I was just pointing the group to this bar right here, Tetralogy of Fallot, where you see 50% of the kids born with Tetralogy of Fallot did not make it past age 10. So thankfully, in the late early 1960s, late 1960s, our technology for cardiac surgery for kids rapidly improved, and we had the ability and capacity to surgically repair some of the problems that we see with Tetralogy of Fallot, and also some of the problems that are also noted on this chart, other congenital heart conditions that without repair led to a limited life expectancy. So the population of adult patients with congenital heart disease is very rapidly growing, mainly because of the successes of great pediatric care and pediatric surgeries that evolved in the 1960s, the 1970s, the 1980s. Kids who would have not made it to adult life because of their cardiac condition, now we're being repaired and making it to adult life. And what, did this, what does this look like? So in the 1960s, the the pie or the total number of patients with congenital heart disease was smaller and that whole pie in modern era is much larger because people are living um, to adult um, ages. But you'll also see the red proportion of this pie or the number of adults with congenital heart conditions and the blue proportion of this pie or number of kids, pediatric patients with congenital heart conditions before we could successfully do cardiac surgeries, most of the people were, were kids and, and didn't survive till adulthood, but we see this red portion of the ply really growing. So there's been a huge emphasis on adult cardiologists really understanding congenital heart conditions and also the complications that can come many decades later after a great pediatric surgical repair. 
This is a graphic and all you have to take from this is the growth over the years. This is healthcare cost spending hospital admissions among the congenital heart disease population. So with this growth in the number of adult patients who now have repairs of these complex conditions, we also see more people coming to the hospital needing procedures and the healthcare costs associated that with that are increasing. And so all we can do to really anticipate the problems that could arise in adults, prevent hospital admissions, get people you know, taken care of as early in the process if a complication is starting to arise, really can save our healthcare system many billions of dollars, as you can see here. And then how do we do as adult cardiologists and thinking about congenital heart disease? Well, this is a graphic looking at how trainees do on the cardiology board exams. And, you, and a lot of these topics here are topics that are common to adult cardiology, coronary artery problems, heart failure, valvular heart problems. But the congenital heart disease section, you see that people tend to do less well on tests. Um, on, on, and so it's really emphasized that we have a great need to better train adult doctors in some of these pediatric conditions now that these patients um, really thrive and do so well as adulthood. And this is an area of strong focus of our group is educating doctors, educating patients, educating people about congenital heart defects so that we can ensure patients are getting the best possible care for their congenital heart disease. This is a graphic that's a little complicated, but to try to um, simplify it, this in this axis here, this is looking at patients who receive care in specialized ACHD centers. And this is over the years, 1990s to 2015, when patients were referred to ACHD centers, we see that the rates of death from complications related to congenital heart disease decreases. So the more patients who are seen by specialists and experts in this field, the better survival, the lower rates of death, the lower rates of complication. And, you know, for some patients who live far from ACHD centers, it may not be easy to get to a specialized um, center. Um, they, they, they're not, you know, all, all over the place across the United States. So identifying local areas of expertise really is impactful in ensuring we're providing the best possible outcomes. Um, and this is another slide just again showing that patients who go to referral centers have better survival. So this is looking at how well people do than patients who may not necessarily have the opportunity for care um, at a referral ACHD center. So we do our best to try to get experts in this field out into our communities, identifying patients who really um, have complex congenital heart needs, figuring out how we can offer as much help and expertise in their local communities um, and then bringing them to our centers whenever we have uh, the need and opportunity when they need procedures or testing. And this is just a little graphic. Again, as I mentioned, not everywhere in the world has specialized ACHD centers. We're very fortunate in the Northeast that there are many centers around us here, but not the case in a lot of the United States. So we have a long way to go to educate doctors, cardiologists, create these centers where there's expertise in congenital heart disease care. So let's now talk about this common condition, Tetralogy of Fallot. So before we talk about the abnormal heart with Tetralogy of Fallot, let's just review and talk a little bit about the normal heart and what normal circulation looks like. This is a graphic of a normal heart here. And you'll see the normal heart, as you probably all remember from schooling, has four chambers. There are two top chambers that fill with blood called the atria, and there are two bottom chambers that pump blood out called the ventricles. The right side of the heart normally receives blood from the body after the body has extracted out all that oxygen. We need oxygen in the muscles to run around and do the things we need to do. We need oxygen in the brain to think. Our kidneys need oxygen. And so all of those organs extract out oxygen from the blood and that blood that has had the oxygen extracted, we call that blue blood without oxygen, comes to the right side of the heart, the right atrium filling chamber, the right ventricle pumping chamber, and goes out the pulmonary artery to our lungs, one on one side, one on the other. So then we give that blood without oxygen to the lungs and the lungs job is to oxygenate, bring oxygen to that blood 
Now that blood becomes red blood in this picture, filled with oxygen, ready to do its job in, in providing energy to the body. That blood comes back into the heart on the left side, that filling chamber, the atrium, the pumping chamber, the ventricle, and goes out the aorta, the aortic valve is labeled here, the aorta that brings this blood with oxygen to our whole body, our brain, our arms, our legs, our kidneys, for all of those organs to utilize blood with oxygen. So again, the right side of the heart receives blood without oxygen that's all been used up by the body, pumps it to the pulmonary artery, delivers it to those lungs, the lungs then provide oxygen. It comes back to the left heart here and gets pumped out to the whole body again with oxygen. So this is the normal heart circulation where there's a nice separation of the red blood and the blue blood. And each side of the heart does its own job to get blood to the right place and where it needs to go. The heart's a complicated structure. You see there are lots of valves. There are lots of chambers. And with that, when the heart is developing in utero, in mom's belly, and that baby is developing, there are a lot of possibilities for things to go wrong in the heart's development. Sometimes holes can develop in between some of these chambers. Sometimes valves might not develop normally. And that can all impair how we get blood to the lungs and how we get blood to the body. So let's get to Tetralogy of Fallot. This is a depiction that was published in the New England Journal about 21 years ago now. This is a really uh, great review paper that had beautiful images here. And this is a depiction of a heart with uncorrected Tetralogy of Fallot. This is the anatomy that people are born with. Tetralogy of Fallot is actually quite common, about one in 3,000 live births. And so many kids are born every year with tetralogy of flow. And the great news is this is a diagnosis often we can pick up when a mom has an ultrasound of the fetus but during pregnancy. So if moms get their prenatal care as they should, this is a diagnosis very often we can pick up and identify in utero such that we can take care of and correct things when the baby is born. Well, what is the tetralogy? It's four problems of that heart anatomy. One problem is there is a hole in between the bottom two pumping chambers. And you can see this can allow blue blood without oxygen to mix up with red blood with oxygen on the left side of the heart. And that mixing of blood may actually allow blood that flows out the aorta to have less oxygen than it's supposed to. And so people, when kids are growing with blood going to their body that has less us oxygen than what is normal, they can often feel fatigued or tired when they exercise, or maybe their organs don't grow quite as well. And these are some features that we may see in kids who have uncorrected tetralogy of Fallot. So the hole in the heart, right here in between the bottom two chambers, is also called a ventricular septal defect. So these are the two ventricles. The septum is the tissue in between, and a defect means a hole. So ventricular septal defect, or VSD, is this hole in between the bottom two chambers. We also will see a narrowing of the pulmonary artery. And that's this valve and artery right here. Remember the pulmonary artery brings blood flow, that blue blood flow to the lungs. Well, with tetralogy of flow, this area is quite narrowed. And so not as much blood flow can actually get to the lungs. And that can be a problem in the lung development for these kids. So we call this pulmonic stenosis as a result, stenosis meaning narrowing or blockage. As a result of this pulmonic stenosis or narrowing, the heart muscle, this right ventricle underneath will get thicker to try to accommodate to that higher pressure because it's pumping against this narrowing. So when the heart muscle gets thicker underneath, that's called hypertrophy, just means thickness of the muscle. So right ventricle hypertrophy or thickening, that comes as a consequence of this narrowing of the pulmonary artery or pulmonic stenosis. And then the last feature is what we call an overriding aorta. So the aorta is that tube that is supposed to bring nice red blood filled with oxygen out to the whole body. So that body, that aorta can deliver blood with oxygen to the whole body. Now remember this aorta is now receiving a little bit of blue blood because of the hole here. And because there's a hole here, it kind of 
sits a little bit over both ventricles and that's the overriding piece. It sort of doesn't really know where to sit. It's kind of overriding or sitting over both ventricles. And as a result, it receives some red blood, it receives some blue blood that all goes out to the body. And the oxygen levels for babies born with Tetralogy of Fallot is low. And that may be one way that the diagnosis can be made after birth if it's not made with an ultrasound before birth. So these are the four parts of Tetralogy of Fallot. Tetralogy means four parts. Dr. Fallot is the doctor who originally wrote about this constellation of findings many, you know, hundreds of years ago. So these four pieces are the ventricular septal defect, the hole in the heart, that overriding aorta, it sits over that hole, the pulmonic stenosis or narrowing of the pulmonary artery, and then the right ventricular hypertrophy or thickening of that heart muscle. So again, these babies are born with low oxygen levels in their blood as a result of this anatomy. So many years ago, before these kids could be corrected with cardiac surgery, back in the 50s and the 60s, even in the 70s, our technology with cardiac surgery wasn't really great enough to put small, tiny little infants under heart bypass and fix these. So we had, if it was even diagnosed, we often had to wait until kids were a little bit older and bigger before they could undergo and, and tolerate a cardiac surgery. Well, what happened to those kids? Well, again, they had low oxygen levels and that really could impact them when they were exercising, running around the playground. They really wouldn't feel good. Maybe their lips would turn blue or their fingers would turn blue. Maybe their body would build up a little bit of fluid because that fluid wasn't moving around in the normal circulation as it should. Maybe they would have abnormal heart rhythms, meaning their hearts would start to beat very fast because of some of these abnormalities. But you know, kids are so smart and they often can recognize, you know what, I'm not feeling good. What can I do to make me feel better? And it turns out we used to see lots of kids who while they were running around on the playground, they would squat down to feel better. Gosh, what, what happens in the body when we squat down that would make them feel better? This is some you know, early pictures of these kids who would squat down to try to feel better. Well, when we squat down, the pressure in the aorta actually rises up a little bit. That pressure rises up in the left ventricle a little bit. And there's a little bit less blue blood going to the left ventricle because the pressure in the left ventricle is a little higher. So in fact, when these kids were squatting down, they were really smart. Their oxygen levels increased just a little bit because with squatting down, they could prevent a little bit of this blue blood going into the aorta. Isn't that fascinating? So years ago in the 60s and early 70s, often cardiologists, if they made a diagnosis of Tetralogy of Fallot, they might wait until those kids were big enough to kind of run around the playground, start squatting down before they actually thought, all right, well, now it's time to do that surgery and get in put them under and, and expose them to a risk of a heart surgery. But they knew that if kids were squatting, that meant that they weren't feeling good, that, that they were, their oxygen levels were low enough. It really was impacting, um, impacting them. So really fascinating physiology. So other things that were done many years ago before kids were able to undergo a full correction was, you know, if we remember part of the problem was there's not enough, there was narrowing of the pulmonary arteries. So there's not enough blood flow to the lungs. And sometimes we would see kids would have, you know, insufficient blood flow to the lungs. Their lungs really just wouldn't develop normally. And then they would start to have problems with their lungs and asthma and their chest wall would not grow quite enough and their lungs were small. So Dr. Helen Tausick, um, Dr. Alfred Blaylock and Dr. Vivian Thomas, um, who received an honorary MD um, years after, um, after his death. Fascinating story about these three important pioneers in congenital heart disease. But they said, gosh, if we could only provide a little more blood flow to these baby lungs, these kids might actually do a little better. They might feel a little better. Their lungs might get better oxygen. And so they developed these shunt procedures. And we won't go into all of the anatomies here, but there are a few different types of shunts where blood flow, red blood flow from the aorta was actually redirected to those pulmonary arteries that were not getting enough blood flow through these shunts. This is called the Bla blaylock tausig thomas shunt or BTT shunt. There were also other types of shunts. It's called the Potts shunt or the Waterston shunt where holes were created between the aorta and the pulmonary artery to really provide more blood flow to those baby lungs so that those lungs could really just grow a little bit better. Those kids could get big enough 
for them to ultimately undergo what was a more definitive cardiac surgery, bigger surgery. So we have lots of adult patients who had these, what we call now palliative, because they weren't curative, but they helped, these palliative shunts to improve blood flow to the lungs. Dr. Helen Tausick really being a tremendous pioneer, one of the very few women in cardiology at the time and a role model for, for many of us um, in cardiology. So today, what happens today if you have a baby born with Tetralogy of Fallot? Well, most babies are actually diagnosed by ultrasound before birth. And most infants um, actually undergo a more complete surgical correction in very, very early childhood. And so often these shunts are not even necessary now. We see many older adults who've had these shunts in the past, but many kids who are born now actually don't need to go through that intermediate step before they go through a full cardiac surgery. Um, and this really is a huge testament to the advances in technology and science that have allowed us to perform very complicated cardiac surgeries on very tiny little infants. So what is this definitive surgical correction? So here's another view of our heart here. This is actually that right ventricle. Here's that narrowed pulmonary artery. What does a surgeon do when he or she corrects tetralogy of flow? Well, what they do is they actually make an incision across that pulmonary artery into the ventricle. They open up that area of the right ventricle and what do they see right underneath? They see that VSD, they see that hole. So they can then patch up that hole with some patch material and some sutures, just like you would patch up a hole in a pair of pants. Not, a, not that it's that easy to do cardiac surgery, but they do patch up that hole. And then they can open up this narrowing in that pulmonary artery, and they often will put a patch in to open up that pulmonary artery. And you can see another picture here where there's a patch in the pulmonary artery. So many of our patients who come to us in the adult clinic, they've had that VSD hole patched, they've had that pulmonic stenosis re relieved, that area has been opened up, and they have a big patch um, in that pulmonary artery. Surgical techniques have gotten even better. So there's some babies where they may not need to make such a big incision here and put in a big patch that can actually later cause problems with the pulmonic valve and a pulmonic leak, right? If you put a big incision through this valve, it's not gonna function quite as well later. And so there's a lot of new and evolving techniques in pediatric surgery to try to improve those surgical um, outcomes. Some patients may have such a small pulmonary artery, do you see in the purple over here, that we really can't surgically open it and they may get a tube graft between that right ventricle, it's sewn in here. I call it, it's like a cannoli. <laughs> it's a little longer on one side than the other and you sew it in on one side, sew it in on the other side. And that sort of bypasses that whole area when the pulmonary artery is very, very small. And this is a depiction that my partners and I put together, Dr. Bob, Dr. Libertson, we, we've written some reviews about congenital heart disease and tetralogy of flow. And this little depiction, I think the artist did a really nice job showing what that looks like. So this is another variant of a surgical correction for tetralogy of flow. Okay, one important fact, congenital heart defects can be repaired in kids and infants, but they are never cured. They are never cured. There is really no congenital heart defect where there is a 0% possibility of complications or problems later as an adult. So we as adult cardiologists who take care of patients who have these pediatric surgeries, we always have to be on the lookout for things that could develop or arise later. And what are those things in adult patients? Well, residual leaks around some of those patches. Sometimes, you know, you're sewing in this patch, this tiny little baby heart, that heart's gonna grow over time and maybe that patch isn't big enough and there could be little leaks around it. There could be re recurrent narrowings that develop along the pulmonary artery and that narrowing can redevelop. So we have to look carefully on our ultrasounds and our tests to look for these things because they can be very hard to diagnose and pick up with some of our standard um, ultrasound views. A very common thing, a leaky pulmonic valve, a leaky valve, we call it pulmonary regurgitation. Regurgitation is a echo term for leak, <laughs> um, but leaky pulmonic valve, very, 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 very common in adult patients. Also very easy to miss this on ultrasounds of the heart. If you're not trained to really look carefully in this area, we spend a lot of time teaching our cardiology trainees about how to really well evaluate the pulmonic area. So leaky pulmonic valve is really common. Important problems with that right heart pump, that right ventricle, it can get enlarged and importantly, it can get weak. 
I too often see adult patients with tetralogy of Fallot who've had leaky valves or things come to us once their heart pumps are already really enlarged and really weak. And I really wish we had met them earlier. There are lots of things we can do to prevent heart pump enlargement and weakness if we intervene or think about these things early enough in the process. We often see patients who their right heart's gotten bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger over the years to the point where it's gotten weak. And the weakness of a heart prop pump is a very hard thing to fix. We can open blockages of coronary arteries. We can open blockages of valves. We can replace valves. We can replace narrowings in areas, but replacing a heart pump is a heart transplant. And so if there's anything we can do to prevent a patient from needing to go on to a heart transplant, we really should try to do that and make sure we're on top of these things sooner than later. So sometimes patients may experience fluid buildup in their body if their heart pump is weak. They may notice that they just feel tired or fatigued or they go out on their walk and they just don't have that energy or they have a hard time walking up a hill because they just don't have that energy. It can be a very you know, not dramatic symptom. People might not even notice it unless you ask them specifically, a year ago, were you able to walk up those stairs without feeling tired? Sometimes people may have abnormal heart rhythms. This is another complication we fear because this is a dangerous complication of abnormal heart rhythms. Rarely can there, that result in somebody dying suddenly. And preventing sudden death with tetralogy flow is a really important objective for cardiologists, doing everything we can to preserve that heart muscle so it doesn't develop these dangerous arrhythmias and result in these problems. And sometimes the right heart pump can get so weak that it makes the left heart pump weak, and that's a really hard problem to deal with. Sometimes that aorta, which was receiving blood flow from both the ventricles, can also get enlarged over time and something we need to monitor. Well, what can we do? There are so many things we can do to help with these problems. So the first and most important thing is if you're a patient with Tetralogy of Fallot or if you have a friend with Tetralogy of Fallot, make sure that they are taken care of in a center where there's expertise specifically in adult patients, an adult hospital with Tetralogy of Fallot expertise in an ACHD center. Because in these centers, there are many, many things we can do to prevent these complications. Some patients may need pacemakers or even defibrillators to help them with the rhythm problems. Some patients may need valves replaced in that pulmonary artery or other valves replaced. And sometimes we can do this through a catheter procedure. Sometimes we do this with an open heart surgery. As you see here, the open heart surgery is an incision through the front of the chest. Our patients who've had cardiac surgery as a child have already had an incision in the front of their chest. They may have other incisions in their body from some of the shunts that they may have needed earlier in their life. This would be another incision. For some of our patients, it's a fourth cardiac surgery or a fifth cardiac surgery or even a sixth cardiac surgery. And so you wanna have that surgery done at a center where they really take care of adult patients and they have surgeons who specialize in this because it's a very unique kind of cardiac surgery. But there's lots of things we can do often to help with some of these problems. This is a patient um, who underwent a catheter ablation procedure to really deal with some of those arrhythmias that were popping up in different areas of the heart. There's lots of screens here um, necessary for these catheter procedures. So a lot of tremendous technology that has evolved in recent years for us that really benefit our Tetralogy of Fallot patients all with the goal of protecting that heart muscle so that heart muscle doesn't get weak, so they don't have heart failure symptoms, so they don't have arrhythmias, so they don't need a heart transplant later. Lastly, I will just a shout out to our um, congenital interventional group here led by Dr. Ignacio Inglesis, the catheter-based pulmonic valve replacement through a catheter here to replace a valve has been a tremendous, a tremendous technology for our patients, allowing us to sometimes obviate the need for another open heart surgery if we can re-replace that valve with a catheter valve. Some of these valves, these tissue valves, are going to wear down over time. That's what happens. That's the natural history of a tissue valve. We may need to replace it again in the future. But with these catheter valve techniques, rather than having an open heart surgery to re-replace that valve over and over and again, we can save them an open heart by doing one of those surgeries as a, a procedure, as a catheter-based procedure, much less invasive, they get home sooner, they recover sooner, they're back up playing golf or whatever they like to do sooner. Um, and um, it really is a trip. So we do a very careful evaluation 
to make sure that we don't miss an opportunity to do a procedure with a catheter option, um, you know, rather than a surgery, if we can, if that's feasible, and if that really is a, a, a favorable thing for the patient. The one last thing I'll leave you with is every patient with Tetralogy of Fallot, their heart is different. I always say it's like a snowflake. Even though all of them were born with these four common abnormalities, they all can have different variants of each one of those abnormalities. They can have different variants of these complications that could happen later. So we think about every patient as a unique individual and what are the specific things about this specific heart that need to be addressed, what are those specific complications that can arise later, and how can we individualize our approach to taking care of that patient? I think in many decades long horizon, I want our patients to be very old, running around with their grandkids, feeling good, celebrating lots of birthdays, feeling well, not having to see me too much in the cardiology clinic with problems or symptoms related to heart failure arrhythmias. We want them living their life feeling great many, many decades from now. And so as we think about these procedures, we actually think about the lifetime of procedures a patient may need and what is the best thing that we can do now to really optimize them sometimes 50 years um, from now. So the take home points is tetralogy of flow is a common condition. We have many, many patients in our clinic who are adults now with unique complications. It often can be picked up um, in babies before they're born. There are complications that almost universally can happen for adult patients. Um, even if the pediatric surgery went perfectly well. This is not a marker that something went wrong at the pediatric surgery, but most importantly, identifying some of these complications as early as possible allows us to take care of them and fix them because before they cause problems with the heart pump. And then lifelong, you know, ACHD care is really critical to their cardiovascular health. So that's what I have today. I'm sure there's lots of questions. I see things popping up in the chat, um, but I will stop there. I'll actually stop sharing my screen so I can see everybody and see people um, and Amy and take questions. So thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. DeFerrier. We are now at the end of the session. So if you have any questions for Dr. DeFerrier, feel free to enter them in the chat box. I do see a number of questions. Give me one moment. So now that there is a subspecialty in ACHD, do you anticipate more cardiologists will be drawn into the field of ACHD? Absolutely, absolutely. We are really doing our best to train cardiologists in this specialty. And we have a wonderful training program here in Boston. That's a collaborative program between Mass General, the Brigham and Children's Hospital. And we train fellows after they've completed all of their cardiology training, they then go on and do two additional years focused in ACHD. I'm proud to say Heartfelt Dreams actually is supporting some of these trainees as part of their mission and training more cardiologists to, to get out there um, for, for, uh, for the care of these patients. So absolutely. And it is many years of training, but it's a terrific investment. Um, and we certainly need uh, more people, particularly there's some areas of the country where there are very few areas of ACHD expertise. That's wonderful. A teenage male born with Tertralogy of Fallot is feeling good now. Why does he need to see a cardiologist at this, at oh, this stage in life? That is such a great question. I see that's coming up from Eric Anker. That's a, such a great question. You will see, and we've talked about this in other sessions, that often teenagers, people in their 20s, they feel great. They're going about their life. They are working, they're busy, they're in school. Why do I need to see a cardiologist? I feel really great. Well, interestingly, some of these complications that we see, particularly leaky pulmonic valves, develop far before patients have symptoms. By the time patients often have symptoms, we tend to see that ventricle got, has gotten quite big and maybe even the pump function is reduced. So seeing a cardiologist when you're feeling great allows us an opportunity to pick up, is there a leaky valve? Is there a residual hole in the heart? Is there some narrowing that we should follow carefully so that we know when is the right time to intervene and we don't miss the boat? Sometimes if we wait till patients really are feeling lousy and they come in and meet us, this happens all the time, by the way, often we find that their heart is really big, it's not working great, they may have other things going on that they didn't realize and the correction or uh, at that point is more complicated. So 
we often don't need to see patients all the time or even every year, but every couple years when they're feeling well, they're feeling great, we might check their exam and their echo and just make sure that they're not developing a complication that they're not gonna feel and they, they don't know about. Okay, so it's helped to monitor. What testing is ordered for adult tetralogy patients to help determine if surgery may be needed? Great question. So there, again, this is highly individualized, but most patients, the standard of what we do is ultrasounds of the heart or echocardiography. These should be done by sonographers or ultrasound technicians who are specialized in congenital heart disease. Sonographers who have this expertise can actually pick up some of these nuances that may not be found in standard ultrasound views. So the echocardiogram is our foundation for screening complications. Often we will do an EKG or an electrocardiogram where there's, you know, stickies on the chest and we get, but that may not be enough to screen for arrhythmias. So occasionally we might need to do a monitor of some sort. Now we have nice easy monitors that are patches we can throw on. They're less bulky than our older monitors. Occasionally we might need to do a cardiac MRI. If the echocardiogram shows us that there's a problem that's developing, particularly if it's affecting the right heart pump, we often can get a lot more special, a lot more specific information from an MRI. I start with the more simple things, physical exam, taking a good history from the patient on how they feel, start with an echo, and then decide what else they might need. And not everybody needs all these things, you know, certainly not every year, but a good physical exam is, is important um, at least every year or at most every two years. Mm -hmm. And are all these tests non-invasive? So these tests that I mentioned are non-invasive. If we find abnormalities and if we think somebody might need to have a surgical procedure, then at that point we might need to do an invasive catheter test to measure pressures or get other information we might not get from a non-invasive test. But we usually only reserve that when people are in need of, we think they're in need of a procedure and that helps us to really identify um, everything we need to know before we go into an invasive procedure. So occasionally catheterizations are necessary, but for most patients, the screening is with non-invasive testing. Okay. And then can a tertalogy condition corrected as an infant worsen in adulthood? Yes, interesting. So these complications like a leaky valve or a weak heart pump can definitely worsen in adulthood. And sometimes, as I mentioned, people may not have symptoms to really know that things are changing or worsening. So sometimes we might even consider doing um, an exercise test where we really quantify exactly what can that heart do. And sometimes that uncovers to us some limitations of the heart that maybe the patient didn't, wasn't even aware of. So yes, and, and we monitor for um, changes. And if any of these things are uncovered, we have to monitor for changes over time. Okay. Why do individuals score lower on CHD than other parts of the cardiology board exam? Yeah, great question. Because not every cardiology training program is affiliated with a center where there's uh, programs for ACHD. So they, those trainees may not just have the experience of meeting patients with congenital heart disease. So one way that we've tried to address this in Massachusetts is we have um, gone to some um, centers in Massachusetts who train cardiology fellows and we provide them with an educational series around congenital heart disease because even if they're not able to see those patients, at least we can talk like we are today and familiarize ourselves with what are some of the complications? When would I need to refer a patient to an ACHD doctor? And when is it safe for them to continue monitoring in a local center? Um, and so a lot of ACHD providers do a lot of this outreach work to centers where there's not an ACHD program, but there are cardiology trainees because they too need to get experience and exposure. We have some fellows who rotate and come here to Mass General and see patients with us um, from centers where they may not have an ACHD program. And we do our best to really expose them to as many different types of pathologies as possible. So we absolutely do our best, but I think it can be hard for all cardiology training programs to have enough experience and exposure. Mm -hmm. And then what kind of exercise is recommended for ACHD patients? Great question. So that really is highly tailored to the individual patient. Some patients who have problems with arrhythmias or weak heart pumps 
we may give them an exercise prescription that looks a little bit different than people who do not have those complications. In general, exercise that is good for the heart and good for the heart pump is aerobic type of exercise, meaning exercise that gets your heart rate up, gets you a little sweaty, makes you feel like you have to take a breath when you're talking. So brisk walking, jogging, tennis, swimming, bicycle, elliptical, these kind of exercises that are endurance exercises that get your heart rate up for a period of time, by far and away are the best types of exercise for the heart. Exercise that is more isometric, meaning weight lifting or you know, lifting heavy objects is less good for the heart. So we often advise our patients, if you're gonna do some forms of weight lifting, which is important to build muscle, right? Just do it lower weights, more reps to really just focus on the toning of those muscles, but not to put excess strain on the heart and the, and the aorta. So really focusing on the aerobic type of exercise. The American Heart Association recommends five days a week of aerobic type of exercise. Now you don't have to join a gym and run a marathon five days a week or anything like that, but it's dedicated time for exercise above and beyond what we all should be doing in daily life, right? Walking up and down stairs and getting laundry and mowing the lawn and all of these things. That's part of our acti activities of daily living. This is dedicated exercise generally for about 30 minutes, whether that's taking a brisk walk or a jog or up and down stairs for, you know, a lot of things count, but doing it regularly is the most important thing. Mm -hmm. And that's Watch such a great question. Before you start an exercise program. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that is a great question because we actually do have an upcoming blood program schedules for next month. I put it in the chat box yeah. on um, ACHD, how do we structure exercise program from this unique population? So stay tuned, hope you can join us. It's going to be in August, August 12th on a Thursday at noon. And I provide that Zoom link in the chat box. So if you can join us. All right, so looks like we have another question. How long is the wait to be seen at the clinic? <laughs> That's a great question. We are, we are, uh, we, ha we do ha um, have a lot of patients right now who we are working to get in, new patients who are working hard to get in to our clinics. We work um, with wonderful um, nurse practitioners, as Amy mentioned, who help to support seeing patients sometimes in between visits, in between their physician visits. And so, but the new patients are seen by our physicians in our program, and we do our best to create time and space whenever works for the patient. Sometimes we'll see patients from, you know, we see lots of patients from out of state or they're traveling far away. And when they come here to see us, we wanna be as efficient as possible with their time. If they need a specialized MRI or if they need a specialized exercise test on the day of their appointment, we really try to coordinate that as best we can on one day. Um, and so we have to be a little bit flexible, but every Monday we talk about all of the new patients that we're working to get into the clinic. And for some patients, it's not urgent that they're seen next week. It may be that their appointment is a few weeks or even a month or two from now. And that's okay because they've had, you know, the testing they need and it's not urgent, but people who need to be so more urgently, we, we fit them in. We really, we're doing our best. So <laughs> to get people in. And then can you talk about how a small hole may be left in the septum during the surgery for infants? Is this common? Yeah, so um, this is a good question. There are many, many reasons why holes, small holes may be left in the heart and not corrected in infants. There's some types of holes in the heart which are actually quite normal and very common in the population. One's called a PFO or patent frame in ovale almost a third of the population has that. And it doesn't necessarily always need to be closed. For most people, it never needs to be touched. And so there are some situations where a surgeon and, their, and the cardiologist make, make an assessment that things that don't need to be touched aren't touched. Sometimes um, if holes are identified, they're patched at the time of surgery. This is why we like to have as much information as possible before the surgery, so there are no surprises in the operating room. Um, Sometimes holes are patched and later in life, a little hole might open up around the patch. And there are ways that we can actually close these holes with catheter-based devices in many circumstances. Sometimes it needs to be reclosed with a surgical correction, but in many situations, we can close them with catheter type of devices. So all depends on where the hole is, how big it is, and you know many features there, but um, we screen for these every time we do these echocardiograms. 
And at what age do you recommend that patients transition from pediatric cardiology to adult cardiology? Yeah, what a great question. So there are, um, so the efforts around transition from the pediatric to adult cardiologists are really um, important efforts in our ACHD community because certainly adult patients are very different than pediatric patients. Adult procedures and testing and so forth can be very different than the pediatric or the fetal you know, um, procedures or testing. And so often that transition may start to happen actually in the teen years, when the mid to later teen years where we may have um, an adolescent patient meet with somebody in our, in our adult program just to meet and get to know and have a face um, even if their care is primarily still with their pediatric cardiologist. And in those years between 18 and about 22, 21, 22, we do hope that there is a transition in care to an adult cardiologist, um, such that at the time often when patients are in college, you know, sort of starting their first jobs, that's a very common time where, you know, as somebody asked in this, People feel great and they feel well and they sort of don't feel like they need to see doctors. But if we've established a relationship and talked a little bit about why it's important just to check in and touch base, the likelihood of them continuing in care is a lot higher. And so often by the time one is about 22, we do try to ensure that they've um, transitioned to an adult cardiologist, importantly, who has expertise in this area. And if say they live in a region where there's not an ACHD center and they have a local general cardiologist, that that general cardiologist is partnered even maybe remotely or via telecommunication with an ACHD center. Um, we, there are some patients where there may be specific needs that they have where that transition might come a little bit later, like even through age 26. But most, you know, um, most you know, hospitals and centers and pediatric hospitals across the country by that point, that mid-20s, there, there is that transition to an adult-based hospital and care and an ACHD program. So um, everybody's a little different, but those are general mm -hmm. guides. Thank you. So while we'll give it another minute to see if there are any other final questions coming in, um, do you have any final thoughts you'd like to share with the audience? You know, these are all really terrific questions. And certainly if people want to know more, I'm always happy to be available um, either via email or phone call if there are other things that come up. And um, certainly if there's specific questions about your own cardiovascular condition, I'll refer you to your um, um, primary cardiologist. But if you feel that, you know, there's um, uh, general questions that I'm always available. So don't hesitate to reach out. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Ferrier, for a wonderful presentation, helpful information, and thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today. As I mentioned, if you're interested in viewing the recording, you can visit the Blum Center website at massgeneral.org forward slash Blum hyphen center. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a lovely rest of the day. Thanks so much. Take care.